Hello, my name is Bayo Akamalafe, and I am grateful to be part of this urgent conversation about saving the planet and meeting contemporary sticky issues about how do we respond to the crises of our times. Um, I felt it proper and more appropriate to actually introduce my daughter not myself. Um, she's not here right now, um, but she's nine and she's this amazing philosopher, nine-year-old magical philosopher. Um, the reason I introduce her to you specifically is because I came home recently. My wife and I just arrived um, home here in India where we make a living um, only to see that the walls, the entrance to our home had been papered over by posters she had made announcing save the earth. I wish I could show you pictures. We didn't tell her to do this. This was not an assignment or anything. Um, she's largely unschooled. Um, uh, she's, she, we have this self-directed educational project with her. But we had not had a conversation about this, but we ha we came home to find posters of turtles with plastic in their in their beaks, their mouths, um, dead animals, and a very, very gloomy, desperate picture of a burning planet. And she announced, she wrote and typed out and printed, wasting a lot of paper, <laughs> saying, save the earth. Do you want for your children do you want for us and my generation to live in a world that no longer exists? Um, and it was such a powerful thing to see. Um, and she had it taped everywhere on the wall. Um, she also had a little tray, a toyish tray, you know, just a few inches wide, um, stapled to the door. And she, and this was her solution to climate chaos. Uh, she said, everyone put your plastic in here. And she's utterly convinced that everyone who comes and places a little bit of trash in that little tiny, you know, seemingly insignificant tray would be doing the whole world a lot of good. <laughs> I had a lot to think about this. Of, of course, we're proud of her and her um, incipient activisms. Um, but I had a lot to think about the idea of saving the world and the inherent tensions and intensities in this idea of saving the world. Of course, the first thing I would note, just to get this out of the way, is the absurdity of offering a small tray, you know, to address the world's problems. And I wonder if, if meeting the absurdity of chaos with the absurdity of a resolution or an absurd approach, you know, an awkward approach isn't the invitation here. But I digress. The thing that really struck me about that event, which only happened yesterday, of the announcement to save the earth, to save the planet, which shares a name with this, with this gathering, this convening, is the is the problem that is associated with saving the earth. And let me put it this way, that my daughter is, um, as I've come to introduce her to you already, she loves to create things. Um, if you give her a room with a stack of paper, she would probably make a tiny object out of that those pieces of paper but she would leave rooms of trash in her wake one day she invited me to see what she'd created and as I came round to seeing what she had created she was excitedly showing me this thing that she made uh, some kind of paper figure and then I asked her I think this is not flattering to me or my fatherhood but I could not help but notice the mess she had made and I could not leave that behind and she wanted me so desperately to celebrate what she had invented 
But to my own chagrin, to my own embarrassment, I focused squarely on the mess she had made. And I could not help but say, we have to clean this up. In a way, I feel that we're, one might say, making the same mistakes with regards to the issues of our time, especially within the paradigm that invests so much in the messaging around saving the planet and reversing the tide of ecological destruction. I feel we're not paying attention to what, what geologists might call the Anthropocene. I feel we're not paying attention to what the Anthropocene is doing or what it wants to do. And in failing to attend to that, we are inadvertently and ironically feeding the crisis, even with our attempts to save the planet. I could explain it this way, that the Anthropocene wants to create a flattened world of mastery. It wants to rationalize the world, to dismiss its wildness, to privilege the human as the agential core of the planet. That is what the Anthropocene wants to do. That is what computational capitalism wants to do, to invest its energies and its desires in reinforcing the creature called the human individual to the dismissal of all other kinds of non-human and more than human agencies that make the world a vital, vibrant and beautiful place. And in so doing, in creating these paradigms of safety, in creating a sensorial monoculture, in creating distance between us and the world, and in investing, you know, I think of the Anthropocene through the Enlightenment, the 19th century project that created the man, the human, this colonial enterprise. In investing so much in the human as a territory of acting, what the Anthropocene does, it's, it creates distance between us and the world. I'm afraid that the call to save the planet is secreted, or one might say, is a product of this distance. Let me expand on that a little bit. Maybe I might say a bit about the architecture of salvation. That this idea of saving the world at least from one genealogy, one perspective, owes some of its legacies to the slave ship, the transatlantic vessel that crossed the ocean, carrying approximately 11 million black bodies to the new world. On many of those journeys, the slaves would want to kill themselves. They would want to jump out to save themselves away from the misery or to distance themselves away from the misery on board those carceral vessels. Seeing that this was happening, the captains of those ships often instituted measures of safety to protect the slaves from diving overboard. And so they created nettings on the sides of the hull of the slave ship to catch the slaves from falling out of the vessels. It does feel like safety can serve nefarious purposes, right? It's not every time that you're saved into something benevolent. You might say that's a slave ship, has nothing to do with our times. But you see, the world is entangled and entangling and it spills and it bleeds into new realities. I see the slave ship in today's working conditions. You might recall the uh, 2010 Foxconn suicide um, events where people in Shenzhen, China, would defenestrate themselves, jump out of windows. And this happened week after week after week to protest the brutal labor conditions in that electronic village that served the world's greatest, the world's giants of computers and manufacturing. The people who were the authority figures in that Foxconn enterprise in China, serving the entire world and its capitalist desires 
for new technologies. Those people instituted nettings as well to catch the laborers from falling out of their office buildings. You see, the slave ship is a contemporary vessel. It never really disappeared. I think my point here then is to say that sometimes safety can be troubling. Sometimes saving things can preserve instrumental relationships and hierarchical paradigms or dynamics. Just because I protect a slave from hurting himself or herself doesn't mean we are on equal footing. Does saving the world release it from its instrumental resource, you know, slavery to human grand designs and our purposes? Does it address the anthropocentricity of modern civilization? Does it help us see that we are not separate and separable from ecologies, from the way the world moves and turns and worlds itself? Or are we speaking about saving the world to continue in the ways that we're used to? Are we speaking about saving the world like one would speak about installing solar panels on a slave ship? Or green resources on a slave ship? Are we speaking about saving the world or sustainability because we are afraid of dying? Because we refuse to be part of a world that is a cycle, that is a beautiful cycle and sometimes terrifying cycle of grieving, of loss, of decay, of falling down, of splintering into new and terrible things? Or are we so committed to the centrality of human systems that we're willing to continue to shackle the earth to our own perpetuity, to our own foreverness. I feel that the question of what do we do differently might best be met or might be best met um, by seeking to disturb our centrality, by seeking to invite a falling down to earth. You might ask, what do we do to address the issues of racial injustice, to, in, to, to address the heat waves that now have names? Zoe, I heard, is the first name of a heat wave that has ever been. Um, what do we do to address um, ocean acidification? What do we do to address uh, the problems, contemporary issues in the world at large that are not disconnected with the dwindling of trust or the rise of proto-fascist governments. What do we do to address these issues? I would say we need to listen with the world. We need to grant the world, this the world as we rudely call it, its freedom papers to let it go fugitive. And by that I mean that the ways that we know the ways that we perform knowledge, the ways that we often centralize data, the ways that we often think about the human in relation to everything else is the crisis. The human is the crisis, not the fires on the mountain, not the smoke pillar that burns clarity and disturbs forward movement. It is our centrality. And so the invitation I feel is to listen, is to fall down to earth, is to open up space for what post-humanist eco-psychologists might refer to as our non-centrality, that we are part of the world and the world is part of us. And so we need to be attuned to what the world is doing from different perspectives. We need to be open to the fact that the world has never been a dead, mute, and non-agential resource base for human continuity. What would it take for us to learn differently if we took it for granted that the world is also alive? And maybe I'll stop there with the impossible invitation that might be voiced in the sayings of my people that the times are urgent, let us slow down. Well, they don't exactly say that. I made it up that way. 
the times are urgent, let us slow down. That in these times of urgency, when we would rather speed up and rush down the highway, there is an invitation to fall off the beaten tracks of the highway and to change the posture of how we meet the world, to invent and cultivate new technologies of humility that might help us generate new fields of thought, new political imaginaries, but only first by listening, only first by doing the weird thing, only first by humbling ourselves and unlearning our mastery over the world that we would rather save so that it can be instrumental to our purposes. I thank you for listening.